of the credits to play out as we as we talk. Um, thank you for coming again. Uh, I'd like to start off and give everyone like a little a bi brief bio of your career so they can understand uh, how you got into primarily uh, directing documentaries, right? Started you actually in the scripted world. Okay, so, yeah. so you can let us know. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was born in Chicago, raised in Milwaukee, didn't know anybody in Hollywood. Uh, so I made an assault on Hollywood after film school. I went to film school at Northwestern and uh, came out here, and uh, it's a bit of a Cinderella story, but I went to work at Paramount as a, a junior executive. And, um, and then I got hired away by a company called MTM, which was Mary Tyler Moore. We did Hill Street Blues and St. Elsewhere and Remington Steel, and very quality TV shows. Uh, but I didn't like being an executive much. The, the politics were too much. It was mostly about how do you save your job as opposed to actually doing it. So I uh, went out on my own and um, uh, produced a pilot for CBS that didn't get picked up as a series. And then uh, I decided there was no future for a producer that didn't write. So I took a year off and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. Uh, scripts for TV shows, and then I got hired to write some episodes of TV shows that I, I would be embarrassed to tell you that I wrote for, uh, so I won't. Um, and then I got discovered as a pilot writer uh, by Bob Greenblatt, who used to run NBC, and uh, so I wrote pilots for a number of years, not one of which got made, but they paid me a lot of money, and it was a great experience, but then I discovered documentaries, so it's been about 20 years making documentaries. Um, so I write, I produce, I direct, I take out the garbage on, on certain days, and um, I get to, to go interesting places and talk to interesting people about interesting things. It's a great job. Um, how did you, what was your first documentary? First documentary was called uh, The Unknown Marx Brothers, and it was about the famous comedy troupe, and uh, um, I had gotten to know Groucho Marx's grandson, and, and he gave me the rights to do it, and we had a great time, and I just loved the form. I loved the storytelling, and uh, I loved uh, being able to, to interview people and work all that in with music and how, how you tell a story. And that's really what documentaries are, are, are very similar to uh, feature films, in that you're telling a story. And so how best do you do that? So it was uh, called The Unknown Marx Brothers, and I loved it so much, I left script writing behind. I love that film. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm surprised anybody saw it. Well, <laughs> I'm a big Marx Brothers fan. Uh -huh. so. so it was like at the time, I remember there was, in a nutshell, was mm -hmm. a, a, like... That was the first one. That, that was, was the about first ten one. Year, ten years before, before. us. Before. Yeah. But yours kind of went... So what what do you do with a film like that where I think in a nutshell was on PBS all the time, especially during their fundraising drives. So what do you do when you have... Not an iconic documentary, but a sort of a reference point to a subject. D was that even in your head when you were going into um, doing your film? Um, what I try to do a, a lot, Rob, is is try to cover a story that no one has done before. Yes. The film that you just saw, most people don't even know the story, much less have covered it anywhere. And so most of the documentaries I've done ha have been that way. It's an unknown story about somebody, even if the somebody is famous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, I mean, I just did an Elvis document about Elvis Presley, who recorded in this room. And um, that's on Paramount Plus now. But um, it's all, it was a different take on Elvis. It wasn't a cradle-to-grave biography. It was a different kind of story. So I'm always trying to find a different way to do it. And sometimes I've seen the documentaries that came before on the same artist. Sometimes I don't. Yeah. I think I'd rather just find my own path and, and go down that. And that is why documentaries, I think people have a bad perception because I view them as the real films. You're, even though it's based on a true, you're taking, how, ma how many hours of footage did you have to work with for this documentary? Well, that's a hard one to say. <laughs> we, I mean, uh, when you make a documentary, um, it's a lot like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, it's different than, I, I don't know if you guys work with narrative at all, but when you work with a narrative film, you have a script. Yeah. And so you're shooting the script. Documentaries, um, you interview people, you have photographs, you have film clips, you have music, and you're, you're taking all of those little pieces 
and you're trying to make a whole out of them, a beautiful picture. The difference between a jigsaw puzzle and what we do as documentary filmmakers is as a, a jigsaw puzzle, those pieces only fit together one way. And so eventually you figure it out and it makes a pretty picture. What we do, you can fit those pieces together 10 ways, 20 ways, 100 ways. And it's what makes your film good, bad, or ugly. And if you guys walk out of a film and you say, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, it's because they fit the pieces together properly. And if you come out and say, that really sucked, um, it was because they didn't fit the pieces together. But documentaries are um, absolutely films. I mostly do feature length documentaries. And uh, we're telling a story of very much like a feature film, except you have different tools to work with. Right. I mean, I feel like uh, that's why I think a documentary is a real film, because you have characters that you have to care about. And character arcs that yeah. you develop over the course of the film. Right. And, uh, and, and I, I realize some of the members are not with us, but the more compelling members, the linchpin of the story is you interviewed, mm -hmm. and he's a very charismatic kind of guy, yeah. and holds your attention. So, I mean, you, you re not to say you were re rewarded, rewarded with that, but you had him. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you saw that and built this kind of the way you told the story around the, these four guys, because they're all kind of charismatic guys. Yeah, in their own right? way, very different characters. Yeah. Um, so instead of a script, what we do in documentaries is I will do all my interviews with the people. Sometimes you interview eight or nine, sometimes you in interview 20 or 25. And once I have done the interviews and I, and I have the stories that they tell or the emotions that they express, then I kind of start putting the pieces together and prepare a script. And then um, we figure out, okay, how do we illustrate these stories? Um, what photos can we use? What film clips can we use? All, all of that. And it's all uh, so that you will all find it interesting, you know? And that, I mean, when I, the uh, first documentary I ever saw, I, I, I was in high school, and it was about the mating habits of the tsetse fly in the South Pacific. It's the most boring thing <laughs> you could imagine. It's just, I just wanted to be out playing basketball or something. And um, so I never wanted to make a documentary like that. So coming out of the scripted world, uh, what you see in my films, like this one, is it's a very dramatic structure. Same kind of structure that you'll find in a narrative film, where there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in this case, we sort of set the table and throw you right into what's going on in Bucharest, Romania. And then we sort of flash back and tell you how we got there. And that's a very traditional, dramatic uh, story um, technique. And I think it's what make, makes my docs different than uh, some others because I wasn't a journalist. I'm not an academic. I, I come from a different world. Do you, do you, were you an inquisitive child? Were you an inquisitive teen? I was team? horrible as a child. <laughs> <laughs> I would ask questions. I, I would, my parents, t I don't I have no memory of this, but my parents told me that we had been invited over to our neighbors one night for dinner and they couldn't find me and I was up, I was up in, in somebody's bedroom going through their drawers looking at what's in there. So I was always a very curious yeah, person. But I think it's, 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 um, it serves me well, in the, in, uh, not so much in looking for people's underwear, but um, in terms of um, deciding what I'm going to do um, uh, for a film because you've got to make sure that all the elements are there for stories. And you have to be curious. You have to be um, uh, not set in your ways and not, and not saying, okay, this is the way it is. Um, I think you have to be so curious that you come at your interview subjects from different angles to try to get the information from them. And you never quite know sometimes what they're going to say. Um, I don't know if you're Beatle fans or John Lennon fans. I did a film called The U.S. versus John Lennon, and I was interviewing Yoko Ono. And she's a tough customer. She's um, very wary because she's been blasted by the press so much in, in her life. And um, so she's very protective. Uh, but anyway, so um, we were doing this interview, and I wish I could tell you it was a really smart question. It wasn't. It was a benign question, but it had to be asked. They did this piece of um, uh, performance art. It was political theater, really, uh, where they did a bed-in in Canada. And so I said, so what was your favorite moment of the bed-in? Not, not the best question ever. Um, 
And she starts to answer, and then she stops, and she says, no, nah, you won't like this. Let's, let's move on. But I had seen something in her eyes that a story had occurred to her. And I said, no, no, wait a second. I just said, you were thinking about something. What is it? She says, no, nah, you won't like it. Let's, let's move on. And then it became three and a half minutes of me cajoling her into telling this story. And it's because I'm curious. If I wasn't, I would have just moved on to the next thing. But it's like, all right, now I have to know what it is she was thinking about. So then she starts to tell the story. And she says, it was late at night. Um, our uh, assistants had gone. The press had gone. It was just John and me alone in the hotel room. Now, I don't know where this story is going, Rob, but I, I'm loving it already. I'm a fly on the wall with John and Yoko alone in a hotel room. And she said, and because we were in the penthouse, there was a skylight. And you could see a full, beautiful full moon through the skylight. And John turns to me, she says, and, uh, and said, here we are promoting peace and love, and we have both. So her lawyer was sitting next to me, and I, I looked at him, and I said, well, that's in the movie. Um, and, and I said, why didn't you want to tell me that story? And it wasn't because it was too personal. It wasn't because um, she thought maybe it's revealing something it shouldn't. She thought it was too small of a story, and I wouldn't care about it. And um, I think the, the one of the important lessons I learned really early on in documentary filmmaking is that this, the... Uh, smallest stories can oftentimes tell you a lot about your characters. And that spoke very much to the relationship between them. And what it did is that it gave me and my colleague at the time, David, um, uh, an idea that we were going to spend more time in the film uh, on the love story between the two of them that was only going to be a, a very small thing. And we actually ended up spending a little bit more because it became a time, screen time. And it just became clear that their romance was very important. And, and that's funny because she's so polarizing, like her persona. But you, did you stumble into, you stumbled into humanizing her mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. but what I want to get to is your how you prepare your, for your interviews. Did you go into that interview saying she's a polarizing person? My, if you ask me, she screams like a banshee. That's her performance, right? <laughs> but you did you go in there saying, I need to make her 3D? Did you have that in the back of your head? And then maybe subconsciously when she you coaxed her that story out of her, did you go, ha, ha? Did you have the ha in your head oh, on your face? Instantly. instantly? You, you just know it. Um my job is to, A, get information out of them, not, uh, and not just facts. It's also my job to, uh, to say, how do you feel about this? So it isn't just, you know, in, in 1972 this happened. It was how do you feel about that? So uh, my job is, uh, I view it as, as the interviewer. I, 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 I do my own research. I prepare my own questions, and I do the interviews myself. And I feel it's my job to put my interview subject, uh, make them comfortable so they will feel they can open up to me. I don't mean dirt necessarily, just that they will open up and like she did and tell a story. And so until they, uh, most of them have been interviewed many times and um, a lot of times you get just stock answers and other times um, uh, they're waiting to see what kind of questions you're going to ask them. Is it going to be the same old, same old, uh, or is it going to be something different? So I interviewed um, a movie star one time, and she ca came in and she said, um, I don't know what I can say about this that I haven't said a thousand times, so let's just do it and can we be done in five minutes? You know, and I had like 30 minutes worth of questions. And um, so we sort of got into it, and like 45 minutes later, she got up and she said, oh, that was fun. Um, so you want to make it interesting, you want to make it fun, you want to ask questions perhaps they haven't been asked a thousand times before, or at least come at it in a different way. And, and what you then want them to do is feel so comfortable. I'll tell you, here's another, um, here's another tip that actually you can use in real life too, but um, I don't just jump in with the next question when they're finished answering a question. I will say, ah, 
And I'll let it sit there for a second. And sometimes they feel like they haven't done well enough for you, so they keep talking. And occasionally they'll give you another story and something more that perhaps you didn't know. So um, you orchestrate an interview. So it isn't just kind of going in there and asking questions. I think uh, I have a basic roadmap of, of um, story points I need to get out of the interview. Um, but then I also have to be open to a moment like this where it's like, oh, well, let's ki kind of come at it this way. But I always try to um, present my subjects as, as 3D human beings. That's really true. Because uh, w I want you, for having to see a film, to like the, like the people at least or feel they're legitimate in what they're saying and, and, and not phony, baloney. So um, very important that they come across with credibility. Who, who, was, the, who was the toughest nut to crack? Out of the blood, sweat, and tears. That's a good question. Um, the toughest one for me going in was David Clayton Thomas, the lead singer. Yeah. Uh, I'd been told he was quite prickly um, and could be quite difficult. And so I was kind of prepared for that a little bit. But again, my, my manner is usually I'm kind of light and open and try to be funny. And I kind of charmed him. But there was a little moment. I wanted him to read something. Um, I don't know if you remember in the film, but I had them reading the um, uh, flyer that, uh, you know, the blood, sweat, and bullshit flyer. And I wanted him to read it. And he just got, no, I, I don't read that kind of, you know, it's suddenly the old David was there, you know. Uh, but e every film, it's different. Sometimes you get um, people who are really good and open, and sometimes you don't. Um, and you just never know. Um, I interviewed Harrison Ford for uh, a film uh, that I did on Sergio Mendez, who's a, a world music artist who's terrific. And um, there was a connection between uh, the, the, the two of them. And uh, Harrison is known for not doing great interviews and, and also um, uh, he doesn't like doing them at all. So I had called up his publicist and, and, and s explained who I was and I wanted him to do an interview. And with great attitude, she said to me, well, why would he want to do that? And I said, just ask him. And so two days later, she calls me back and said, well, we're all shocked, but he wants to do it. So he showed up, uh, no entourage, no assistant, just him, drove himself, and he came in. And it was just like really down to earth and an interesting guy. I was prepared for a guy that would give me, you know, yes, no kind of answers. And he was very chatty. And what it was just, uh, you may never see the film, but... Before he was Harrison Ford, he was uh, a contractor, a carpenter. And um, his, fir his, biggest, his first big job was doing a home studio for Sergio. And so no one ever asks him about this. So he was kind of thrilled to be able to do a whole interview about something no one ever asks him about. You know, I've met him in a professional sense. And what the way you described him, he was very nice and sweet. And not, I was not prepared for yeah. for that at all. You're expecting sort of the, the tough guy. S yes, we're So I'll just give you an example of an interview. So I started off with, you know, so how did you meet Sergio and what did you feel? And then he started to open up and, and warm up and tell some stories. And we were getting along really uh, nicely. So I thought, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna finish this up with a question. I, I was not on my list. And I was going to, it was just because I was curious. So um, the second to last question, he said, the thing, he said, the thing about Sergio was that Sergio never asked me if I'd built a studio before. And, and, uh, and I said, so what did you tell him? And, and he said, I'm an actor. I make shit up. <laughs> and he, whatever he said to Sergio. So I thought, well, that was very funny. So anyway, so I'm feeling pretty good about this. So um, we finished the question, and then I said, yeah, I'm just going to ask one more. And the, and, and, the, and the last question was, if you were Sergio, would you have hired you? And he said, would I have hired me? He said, fuck no. <laughs> and that's kind of who he is. He's a little rough around the edges with his language. Yeah. Um, but it was all in fun. Yeah. And again, I had, m I had made the environment such that he felt comfortable doing that. And the film is better off for it because then you get personality, not just somebody giving you facts. N now, in two instances, you said to me, it was this kind of abstract question that opened up these people. So is that a technique you use? Did it, how long did it take for you to figure that out? 
you know, I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious. Well, I think I if you ask 10 of us who make documentaries, you're going to have 10 different answers to that question. Yeah. Um, what I always find is that it takes a bit to, to get somebody to warm up to you. So I'll usually ask a question that isn't really that important, that if I get something fine, if I don't, that's okay. Um, but it kind of gets them going and it gets a sense of who I am with them. Um, but then I'm leading them somewhere. I, it's, it's, um, uh, it's a journey, this interview. And so um, I kind of know where I'm going, but I also, as I say, want to be open to being spontaneous. And so, oh, that's kind of interesting. Tell me more about that, you know? So it's a little bit of that. In this film, you have to get to somewhere because it's so very specific. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing when it, the story came to you for however, and I would like to get to how it came to you, but you know you have to say what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears. I mean, that's the narrative from the get-go, right? Yes, that's right. So I can see in this movie how you have a roadmap you need to get to. You need to hit these points. What, which one of your films wasn't that way? That it was like um, a new experience each time you hit a story arc? Yeah. I don't th actually, to be honest, I don't think I've ever had a film that's, that was that way. No. You know, there are documentaries that, that are cinema verite where, where they're following somebody around and, and then they kind of make a story out of it. I'm always telling a story that's happened before. So I kind of know a lot of the high points. This one was interesting in the sense that, um, I don't know if you've heard uh, Rashomon, the uh, story, where you have five people th or six people that witnessed the same event, uh, but they saw it from different perspectives, so they saw different things. And uh, that was the story with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, is that not all five of them were every place at every time during the story. So each one of them knew a little something different. And then it became my job to piece it together to say, all right, what really happened? And can I corroborate what happened? You know, or is it just some strange memory they had? The guy that actually was the glue here was the older gentleman who, who was the director of that film, Don Camburn. If you don't know his name, you should look him up. He, is an e he was an editor of wonderful movies like Five Easy Pieces and Romancing the Stone and some other things. Great editor. This was going to be his first uh, directing job, and he never got another opportunity, unfortunately. But he's a wonderful guy. And he was there for everything. So he saw stuff that the band members didn't see. And so it was wonderful that we got him. I'll just tell you just a quick story. He was 91 when we found him. He was living in an a assisted living facility in Burbank. And it was during COVID. And they wouldn't let him out, and we couldn't get in. And so it's, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? I talked to him on the phone, so I knew that his memory was very sharp, and he had all these great stories. So we smuggled in a microphone, and, and we did, uh, 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 from his iPad, we did a, an audio interview only, so at least I had him telling some of the stories. But then we hit a three-week period during COVID where they, they did let him out. So we had him come, and we, we did the interview that you saw, and our film would not have been anywhere near as good without him. He saw so much. That whole story about smuggling the film out of Romania, no, the guys never saw that. They didn't know that story, except they, they'd heard about it. But from one guy, but um, Don was there, he knew it, and so um, sometimes you get lucky. How long into the process did you discover him? Well, you, it you was, I would say it's about halfway, halfway, two thirds of the way. We were looking for him and we couldn't find him. Because, you, I mean, obviously they were shooting a documentary, so yeah, you knew right. that part. Right. What I'm curious about is the, f the mysterious missing destroyed footage. <laughs> So all right. you had to work with was the TV, was the unshowed TV special? Yeah. What happened, Rob, was um, uh, Bobby Columbi, who leader of the band, had seen my uh, film I had made on John Coltrane. the, the iconic, Great movie. You should watch it. The iconic jazz artist. And so he called me up, and he said, uh, we knew each other just a little bit. And, and he called up, and he said, I want to take you to lunch. I have a story I want to tell you. I said, okay, great. So we go to lunch, and the first thing I, I tell him is that, you know, I'm a huge fan of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, but what the hell happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears? I said, here you were, the biggest thing going, and then you weren't. What happened? And he said, that's the story I'm going to tell you. And he told me the general outline of the story because that's all he knew. 
we ended up finding a lot of stuff that he never knew that was going on behind the scenes and all of that. But he started, and in the middle of the lunch, he says, oh, anyway, when we were out there, this documentary crew was with us. I said, wait a second, there was a documentary crew with you? And he said, yeah, we brought this documentary crew with us for, the, for like the whole tour behind the Iron Curtain. I said, there's film on this thing? And he said, yeah, but I don't know where it is. So we, we looked everywhere. We, we finally determined that there were about 65 hours of film that they shot. You saw that. And we just couldn't find it anywhere. Band didn't have it. The label didn't have it. Um, most of the people who were involved with the documentary were dead. Um, and so we didn't quite know how we were going to the make government? this documentary. You didn't go to the government? We went to the State Department. We went to the National Archive. We went to the Library of Congress. It's really interesting. Um, when you're making a documentary, you're, you're a bit of a filmmaker, but you're also a bit of a detective. you got to find stuff. And so we spent a lot of time. So I thought, well, geez, you know, we're never going to get this movie made because we don't have the film. We checked every independent um, film storage facility here in L.A. where filmmakers back in the 70s might have put stuff to store it uh, in temperature-controlled vault and stuff. And um, nothing, 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 nothing. Then one day I got a call from a woman who ran a vault that's actually just down the street here. And... Um, uh, it was not in her database, but during COVID, she had some extra time on her hands, and she pulled out some old loose-leaf binders that had uh, just pages and pages of paper in it, and, and buried in one of them was some vague reference to blood, sweat, and tears. So the next time she went into the vault, in a far corner, in a pile of stuff marked for destruction, uh, we found... Uh, the print uh, of the one-hour version that had never been shown either. And so all the film you saw from it came from that one-hour version. And we, we never did find the 65 hours, and as you saw, our feeling is it, it was taken back. And, and I don't think nefariously. I think the State Department took it back. It was, uh, it was in a facility somewhere. It was taking up space, and they just needed the space, and they threw it out. Mm. But my nightmare is that I'm going to come to a group like this and one of you is going to get up and say, why didn't you call me? It's all in my garage. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, obviously, these were controlled countries, but it, was there footage in any of these countries that was shot when the band came there, like news footage or something? Great question. Um, <laughs> um Several pieces of film in there um, came from that. Uh, there was a black and white uh, TV concert that they did in uh, Zagreb. That came, we found that buried in an archive in, in the former Yugoslavia. So they had broadcast some of the concert one night and we found it there. Um, and then we found some Polish newsreel footage that opened the section when, when we take you to Poland. Um, but no, they didn't have anything else. Wow. Yeah. What we did find though, we found uh, reports from the Romanian secret police about what they found about the band members when they had them under surveillance. So that was kind of a cool thing. Did you blackmail any of them with that information? <laughs> no, we didn't <laughs> do that. <laughs> um, so they also had their own cameras and stuff. Where Was that saved anywhere, the f those photos? No, they, they had lost all their Super 8 movie camera stuff along the way. Um, what they did have were photographs. So a lot of the photographs you saw came from the band. Was there one in particular member that had more? Bobby Columbia had uh, probably four or five hundred photos. Wow. Slides and uh, and prints and negatives. And so I went over to his house one day and, you know, kind of went through them. I want to go back to when you had lunch with him. So yeah. before you had lunch with him, you weren't having lunch with him because you knew about the story or? No, I didn't know anything about this story. So how I just I just liked the band. So when he called, I thought, well, this would be interesting. And the more he started to tell me about this story of, um, I mean, today, if you think about it, when you, when you, when you um, read something online about what, you know, CNN or Fox or whoever, hopefully none of you watch Fox, but, um, uh, and you hear about all the stories these days, what you see is that people are getting criticized by the left uh, or the right. As Bobby Columbia says in the film, what made this situation so different is that they were criticized by both sides. They got hammered by both sides. And I just thought this was fascinating. So the more, so after lunch with Bobby, I kind of went off and did some due diligence. And there wasn't a lot to find because this was not a, a, a well-known story. But what I did see intrigued me a lot. And so um, 
I decided if we could find this film, we'll make it. We'll try to make this documentary. Later on, what we did was uh, we, we found that all the State Department files on this particular adventure that the band went on um, uh, were not at the Library of Congress, were not at the State Department, were not at the National Archive. Uh, they had all been donated in the 80s to the University of Arkansas. Perfect place. No idea why. And, um, and, and so we were able to g get all of those files, and through them we were able to piece together a lot of what was going on behind the scenes. And I just said, this is a great story. And it, yes, it took place before any of you were born, um, but it doesn't matter. It's a band uh, of, of young people who got stuck in a an political intrigue not of their own making, and they had to deal with it. How are we going to get out of this? And I think that's a, a very timeless story. They were really, it was canceled, cancel culture before we knew what that was. Now, when you m had lunch with Bobby, were you working on something else? And you go, hmm, this goes to the side, <laughs> this goes to the front. No, at that time I had just finished the Herb film. Herb, I did a film on an iconic musician named uh, Herb Alpert. Uh, that was very big in the 60s. Um, and um, I was about to start one on Elvis. And um, the Elvis thing kind of took a while because the producer hadn't found the money for a while. So I was able to jump into this one. And I was very glad that I did. Now, and, uh, had that situation happened to you on other films where you go, hmm, mm. this is this would probably be a better use of uh, my time? Not often. Not often. You know, I'm an independent. So um, I choose the projects I want to do. And so usually if I've chosen it, it's because I really want to do it. And uh, if anything, I'll say that other one can wait a little bit, you know, for that. Um, but I will say, I, I understand a lot of you guys are marketing kind of stuff. Is that right? Well, marketing business or students. Business side, okay. Yeah. One of the things they do not tell you in film school is that you're going to have to spend as much uh, of your time um, uh, finding money for a film as you are actually making it. And so sometimes a network, sometimes a studio, sometimes a streaming service will pay for it. Um, and sometimes you've got to go out. Uh, I call it the knee pad tour, where you have to get down on your knees and beg for money. Um, and, and you're trying to find somebody who has a passion for the subject um, that you want to make. And, and hopefully you can get them to fund it uh, independently, and then you go ahead and you sell the film. That's what we did with this one. I sort of felt that if I was going to walk into Netflix or Amazon or any of the, the, the streaming services and say, so I want to do this film about blood, sweat, and tears, it was going to be to some buyer who was 30 or 35 and, and uh, had never heard of the band. It was like, nah, said, we don't want to do that. So I felt in this case what I wanted to do was to make the film, show people how good it could be, um, and then we would make a, a sale to a, a platform. Um, but always, again, we had to find the money. So um, sometimes, um, I would say almost every time, you have to find somebody who's going to get you to someone with money. And you hope that they will have the same passion for the subject that you do. Uh, in this case, what, ha what happened was um, a, guy, a guy had called up Bobby Columbi, um and wanting to buy a drum set that he had. He's this rich guy who l loves drums, and so he wanted to buy Bobby's drum set. Bobby has like four or five of them, and Bobby didn't want to sell it to him. And, and it was like, oh, well, what a shame. Well, what do you do? What do you? Uh, and, and then he said, well, so what are you working on now? And Bobby says, well, I'm helping this filmmaker, John Scheinfeld, um, make this film. He said, well, you know, I invest in films. <laughs> it's like, really? So Bobby connects me to this guy. This was the easiest deal I ever had to make. He loved the band, loved the story. Within three weeks, we made the deal, and we were off making the film. A lot of times, I mean, it took the Elvis film, it took us three years to find the money. Uh, U.S. versus John Lennon, it took us seven years to find the money. So it can really be a short or, or long period of time. Now, from beginning to end, how long did it take you to make this film? This one, this took about two years which is uh, about six, seven months longer than normal, and that was because we were slowed down by COVID. Yeah. So there was a period where we couldn't get on a plane and go somewhere and interview somebody, or we couldn't get into an archive or a library. Uh, and the lead singer, David Clayton Thomas, lived in Toronto, and uh, they weren't allowing Americans in for the longest time. And uh, finally, they opened up the border, and we, we got up there as fast as we could to, to interview him. 
long did you interview him for? Most of my interviews are about an hour, hour and a half, okay. somewhere in there. It depends how verbal they are um, and, and what uh, if I feel I've gotten what I need with him. I think it was, it was close to an hour and a half because he was telling some interesting stories. Now, this is, an, I, uh, this is a question that just occurred to me. You're interviewing a subject, go off on a tangent, and they go, you know, I have a, better, I have a story for you that would make a, a good movie. Has that ever happened to you where you were making a documentary, then you found huh. out a story that you go didn't wouldn't fit into the story you're trying to tell, but you go, hmm. I'll, I'll that's a it's a that's a really another good question, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> um, off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of it. I I know it has happened. Um, I'm not thinking about it right at the moment. Yeah. So maybe it'll, it'll occur to me while we're finishing here. I mean, I would think also, unlike being a, making a narrative film, you, it's not like you're at a loss for ideas for films, right? Do you feel there's always a story to tell? So I don't, that's one part of my brain I don't have to fill with war, dread or writer's block or being a creative block, that sort of thing. Have you ever had that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think every time I start a film, and I'm uh, uh, and I'm preparing. Well, two things. Uh, when I'm starting the film, there's always the thought: Is this the time they're going to find out I'm a fraud? <laughs> well, <laughs> and we I all don't. Feel that. And, and I don't know what I'm doing. I felt it during this interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or um, am I going to? Uh, but also, am I going to be able to do justice to this subject? Great story. Uh, am I going to be able to give it my best and and, and bring it out in the way it should? Uh, and then you get that day when you're starting your script. And, and that's when that really kicks in is, oh, geez, I've got all this great material. How am I going to fit these pieces together? So I wouldn't say writer's block, but I think it's always that moment of intimidation where it's like, am I going to be up for this? And I think any creative person, whether it's you know somebody super famous like Spielberg or Scorsese or somebody not so famous like me, um, you approach your material, and 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 you're gonna have that moment. And I think it's what makes the creativity even better is when you have that insecurity about how am I gonna handle this story. Yeah. He called me. Uh, he had seen my film Chasing Train about John Coltrane, and he was a fan. And somehow this, he hadn't really thought about having a movie made about this story. But at some point, somebody had. It had come up at some party or some something or something, and he started to think, you know, maybe somebody could make something out of this, and he thought about me, you know. And so, uh, so often that'll happen. Somebody will call me up and say, so I have an idea, and what do you think? And, um, and uh, that's really nice, and sometimes they're my ideas that I try to then go find the money for. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Um, so when you finish the film, who did you show it to first out of – did you show uh, it to Bobby? Showed it to Bobby first. Uh, he, uh, Bobby and his wife, and um, they were incredibly moved by it. Uh, but I told him this is going to be a roller coaster for you. You were there. This has a, a significant impact on your life, and um, it's going to be very emotional for you. And it was totally was. Um, he saw it several times, um, uh, and then we showed it to a couple of the other band members. I just want to make sure we were on the right track. That maybe we hadn't said something that we shouldn't have. Um, and uh, the one person that didn't get a chance to see it is Don Cameron, the older director. Um, he had some real health problems, and he died before we finished, and so I really wanted to show it to him. But his girlfriend, his 88-year-old uh, girlfriend, uh, came came to see uh, – um, we were in theaters around town uh, in, in uh, uh, March and April, and she came to see it, uh, and um, – she was in tears afterwards, it's just because uh, he'd heard she's heard some, some of the stories, but to see how well he presented himself. No, he was great. Um, and the others followed suit. They, wh what was David's take on the? David thing? loved it, just loved it. Um, I had sent him a link to see it, and he just thought it was terrific. They all thought, you know, it's really interesting. Think about this: if 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 something had happened in your past that created a real problem for you. Um, and, and you couldn't do anything about it. And then years later, somebody comes back and starts to talk to you about this. 
there can be a range of emotions. You can be um, angry about what happened back then. You can be sad. Um, you can um, um, be very emotional about it. You can be very factual about it. So you can get all kinds of responses from people. But I think mostly what I got from these guys was sadness. That they were on a real run here as a band, and they, the sky was the limit for them, and then suddenly it was all taken away from them. And I think the, ab the opportunity to tell their story was very welcomed by them. But I did get, in addition to the humor and the other things, you get moments of sadness where you could just sense that they were, uh, they were still a little, little sad and, and maybe a little pissed off that this happened to them. What I like so much about your film, as someone who's professionally had to see thousands and thousands of films, is you didn't feel the need to do those bumper, and then David went on to, you know what I mean? Because they did have sort of another 10 year, the band existed in some sort of way for another 10 years. Right, things why, were never the same, but yeah. They were never the same, but why did you explore that at all and just felt it was unnecessary? Yeah, I kind of thought, I mean, we, we thought about it. Um, what Rob's talking about is, you know, would we do a crawl at the end that said, you know, after this, uh, the, this is what happened to all the members. Um, I kind of thought that was TV. You know, it's what you see on TV sometimes where it's a little obvious. Somebody said, a, a lesson I learned really early on, somebody said the difference between film and television is that television tells you what you're going to see, they show it to you, and then they tell you what you saw. They are treating you as not being very smart. Film unfolds. It allows things to unfold and, and it lets you experience more of what it is and they don't have to lead you by the nose all the time. And um, that's what I, the approach I take with all my films really is I treat, I treat the people who watch it as being really smart and that they can follow things and, and we try to, try to structure the story in a way that you're a bit on the edge of your seat that you really want to know what's coming next. And uh, so I find that to be really important. Because in, from knowing the story, because I knew the band as a kid, we listened to them. So, um, and as a vinyl collector, <laughs> that's one album you can't escape. It was so huge. But he, there was a dramatic arc in my mind of the continuing story where he left the band, but then came back maybe three or four years later. Yeah. So that seemed to me maybe that was very interesting. Interesting, but not our story. Um, um, I made a decision early on that this was not going to be a history of the band. If we were doing a history of the band, that would have been a very interesting story. But we were really capturing a moment in time. It's not not we we gave you you know the the genesis of the band, but it wasn't a history of the band. This was this was a political thriller about what happened to them when they got stuck here, and I just sort of felt that's off story. And that these are the des decisions you have to make also as a filmmaker. What's on story and what's, o what's off story? From the get-go, that mm. was your mindset. Absolutely, yeah. So when you interviewed them, never came up? Never came up, weren't interested, yeah. So is that discipline you had already or discipline you learned from your career of making documentaries? No, I think coming out of the scripted world um, where you have to be very precise in your storytelling um, you know what your story is, and you got to tell it in in fifty minutes or fifty, you know, forty five minutes, whatever it is. Um, so you don't want to waste time, and you don't want to waste effort. And so I have to be very clear about what my story is. Again, I think if you're making a um, cinema verite documentary where you're shooting a lot of footage, and then you kind of figure out what your story is. Again, I'm telling something that's already happened, so. I can really shape the story right from the get-go, and that's what I try to do. That doesn't mean you don't get surprises, you don't learn something like, like the Yoko story. Um, but I have a general roadmap, general sense of what the story is, um, and, th and I find that's really important. So, is that your, so when you're trying to woo people to speak to you about this particular story you're telling, is that your calling card? I'm not gonna, ask you about an affair you had 10 years after <laughs> the story, or maybe you will, but I, I want to stay on point. This is, do they know this is the story you want to tell? Yes, I mean, I, I'm always pretty clear about, uh, we're gonna be talking about this, um, but I do not share questions ahead of time. And mostly what, what they will be told is, 
Look at the kind of films John makes. They're quality, they're, they're intelligent, they're for smart people. We're not doing TMZ or tabloidy stuff. Um, and so uh, that makes him feel a little bit more comfortable that I'm not gonna be looking for dirt. Because I'm not really, I'm telling a story. Um, and sometimes somebody will tell me something that is kind of dirt. Um, and I won't use it, um, uh, not for, for any reason other than it's not, it's off story and I don't, you know, it's, it's what not is, something. What is it? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so getting back to, uh, there's one thing I want to know. Who was your hardest get and how did you get them? I mean, Yoko and not, not for this one. This yeah. one was pretty, no, this one the was the pretty, films you made. This was pretty easy. Um, Harrison Ford was difficult. That took a while. Um, I would say the toughest one was somebody I never did get. Um, For the U.S. versus John Lennon and for another film I made called Who is Harry Nilsson and Why is Everybody Talking About Him? Great film. You should watch that. Um, I wanted to get Ringo Starr for both of those. John Lennon, obviously, and Harry was Ringo's best friend. We tried for months and months, every which way, uh, e- even showing him, uh, sent, we sent a bit of film over so he could see it, and uh, couldn't get him, never did get him. And the, and the thing is, um, I don't know if you're Beatles fans, but um, Ringo likes to be this guy. Hey, we're having a good time. And he doesn't like to feel emotional or express his emotions. And... Uh, there are three people in the world that, uh, whenever he talks about him, he can risk getting emotional: Harry, John, and and his mother. And so he just wouldn't. Um, but if uh, we got Walter Cronkite, I don't know if that name means anything to you. He was uh, the 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 top newsman uh, for many many years. We got him for U.S. versus John Lennon. Um, we got Gordon Liddy for that film. Gordon uh, was a. Oh. Uh, a, cr- a crook and a, a scoundrel. Yeah, and there was a point where he would have talked to anybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes they do, sometimes yeah. they don't. And um, uh, but you look at we've we've gotten some really famous people, and mostly it's because we we go after them and, and and we're asking them to talk about something they have a passion about or or knowledge about. We're not asking some stranger to come in and talk about blood, sweat, and tears. You know, somebody has uh, has a story they want to tell. Yeah. Um, some more than others. Um, but I would say Harrison probably was because he's you know the one of the biggest movie stars in, in the world. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you another quick story if you want to hear about about chasing train. Um, John Coltrane did not do any television interviews, uh, so I, I couldn't have him in the film speaking on camera. He only did a handful of radio interviews. I've heard that. I've heard that. Now. Yeah, and the sound wasn't great, so I really couldn't use him. But I wanted him to be represented in the film, and he had done a lot of uh, newspaper and magazine interviews, so I had his words. So I took a lot of his words and peppered them through the script to illuminate what he might have been thinking or feeling at a particular time in his life. And then because I'm little Johnny from Milwaukee and I'm, 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 I'm a relentless optimist, I said, I want to go get a movie star to, to read his read, words. Read, speak the words. Yeah. So I went to a a uh, casting director that I, I know named Vicki Thomas, who's wonderful. And I said, so here's what I'm doing, and, and will you help me? She said, oh, I love your film, sure. She said, make a list for me of, of who you want and write me a paragraph for what you want them to do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go see if I can get them for you. And the reason you want a movie star narrator is not only because of the talent, but also to market the film. Um, it, it sets the film apart from somebody else, and, and the critics will speak to whoever this is. So on a Wednesday, I send her all this stuff. And on, on Saturday, uh, she calls me and she says, your top choice is in, but he needs to talk to you. Great. So here's his phone number. He never answers his phone, but don't worry about it. He will call you back. So Great. So I don't know if any of you have had this experience where you call somebody not expecting to get them, but you do. Uh, and so... I call and it picks up, hi. And it's like, uh, 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 couldn't quite get the words out. Uh, anyway, explained who I was. Oh, yes, right, John. Uh, love Coltrane, have to see the film. I said, okay. So we send him a link to the film on, uh, on this uh, Monday. And um, 
it wasn't done yet. It was still fine cut. And my editor's voice was speaking the words of Coltrane. Um, so a week goes by, and I don't hear a word. And I'm convinced that he hates yeah. it, and so we're going to have to like go to my second choice. So, um, but then on, 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 on uh, the seventh day, the phone rings. He doesn't say hello. He doesn't say, you know, how you doing? Uh, but it's this voice that I recognize very well. And, and he says, it's beautiful, brother. When are you coming to Pittsburgh? He was, it was Denzel Washington, and he was making fences in, in Pittsburgh. So I, I flew out to Pittsburgh, and we had him do it. Um, and, and, and so he could have said no. He could, um, he, he might not have even watched the film all the way through. There's so many things that, that could have gone wrong there. Um, and, but as a filmmaker, you want to be persistent. You want to believe in your film and your vision of the film, and you want to go after what you want. And I think the other thing is um, uh, I never take no for an answer. And, and so I could have talked myself out of it and said, oh, no, you're never going to get Denzel Washington, so why are you even bothering, you know? Um, so um, that would be some advice I would give to you, uh, whether you're filmmakers or business people or whatever, is believe in what it is that you're doing and go after it and don't let anybody tell you you can't. Um, growing up in Milwaukee, um, um, I cannot tell you how many people said to me, Hollywood is so far away, you're never going to find a job. You're never going to get hired out there. If I had a dollar for, for everybody who said that to me, I would have been so rich I wouldn't have had to come out here. Um, but I believed in myself and ultimately found the way. So that, that's what my advice on that would be. One thing I wanted to ask you is, you where you watch you can tell when someone watches the link right so were you sitting there watching to see if he watched it yet yeah i, I was <laughs> and like for you know four or five days it was like nothing you know yeah and then he saw it and, and or somebody watched it yeah it could have been an assistant for all yeah. i knew but i i will say this about denzel which is fascinating I, I i have worked with a lot of famous people and sometimes they do not even look at the script until they come into the studio denzel came in prepared he knew how he wanted to play Coltrane, and uh, so we talked just a little bit about it, but I didn't have to give him much direction at all. He just knew what he wanted to do, and that's a pro. He was just a real pro. Awesome. Uh, I wanted to end our conversation on the music. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously, you did, you've done many stories on with musicians. Um, with with uh, this particular film um you had did you use the studio tracks or you used the tracks that they had recorded live what was your main source and how e how hard or how easy was it to get that material right um main source were live recordings that they had made while they were overseas on this tour uh which is a tale uh, unto itself uh, we knew they had brought along a portable 8-track uh, tape machine with them, not the kind that people used to have in their cars, but just a portable one that was studio quality. And they recorded all of their concerts, and we couldn't find those tapes either. Uh, they were went the way with the, the, the other film. Uh, but again, because we are relentless, um, I have this great uh, researcher working with me named Kathleen, who's, who's as sweet as they come and and don't take... Don't take uh, her, her exterior um, for what it is because she's like dogged. She just will go after everything. Anyway, she tracked down uh, the family of the associate producer of the documentary that never happened. He had died in 2018, and so we couldn't talk to him. But when he died, his family donated uh, the contents of his storage unit to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Library. And uh, it just sat in a box, or boxes uh, in, their, in their archive. No one even bothered to look at it. And so she kept saying, well, please, would you do that? Would you do that? Would you? And finally, one of the archi archivists took pity on her, I think, and opened up the box. And amongst all of his stuff were five of these eight-track tapes. And across um, those five tapes, it was all but two of the songs that they had performed on the concert. So we took him into Capitol Studios, just around the corner here. Uh, Bobby and a great engineer named Alan Sides 
uh, mixed the eight tracks. These tapes had never been played since they were recorded, so they were in pristine condition. And we're sitting in Studio A at Capitol Studios where Frank Sinatra and the Beatles and other people had either been or recorded. And, um, and it's like this stuff was recorded yesterday. So we mixed them. And that's why when you're sitting here, it just blasts out at you. It's so powerful, that music. There were some of their songs that uh, they had not done uh, live. And so we licensed um, those master recordings from Sony Music, who owns their catalog. Was that hard, difficult to get Sony to? It's never hard. It's just uh, a matter of money. Yeah. Um, it took us a while. We ended up negotiating a very good rate. I mean, sometimes, like, Bruce Springsteen gets a million dollars to have one of his songs in a film, you know? Oh, if, he if he decides to let that happen. If he decides to let it happen. And thereby hangs a tale. I'm going to share another story with you about Bruce Springsteen. Um, I did a film about 10 years ago um, uh, about um, uh, Chicago's love affair with the Chicago Cubs baseball team. And I wanted a big anthemic song to finish the film that brought together all the, the themes of the film. And Springsteen has this song called Land of Hope and Dreams, which is a beautiful song. So I wrote this really passionate email to his manager, who I did not know, to say, here it is, we're doing this song, it's about baseball, it's about America, it's about, please, please, please let us use this song. And didn't hear from him for four months. And um, finally he writes me uh, uh, an email and he says, um, I talked to Bruce, big baseball fan. He's not a Cubs fan, he's a, he's a Yankees fan, but... Uh, big baseball fan, so he understands what you're doing here. And he had seen your John Lennon film, so you can have this song. So they charged me not a million dollars. They charged me $1,500 for the song. It's like, this is nothing. And then we, uh, whenever you license a song for a film, you have to do it twice. You have to, uh, and this was Brad's uh, life for, for a long time, you have to license the master recording from the record label, but then you also have to license the publishing from the people that wrote the song. So um, Bruce did both. So we, we licensed the master for 1500 and his publishing for 1500 So amazing. So now I'm getting greedy. I want to open up the film with something really exciting as well. And I had a Tom Petty song that I, I wanted called Running Down a Dream, which is what the Cubs fans had been doing for 100 years. And he didn't care. Uh, they, they just didn't even respond to me. So I was getting very depressed, so I went into my iTunes library and spent the weekend, and I found a song that was even better. Tempo was right, so I didn't have to recut any part of the film, and the lyrics were actually really right on point. And uh, so I wrote the same kind of letter. It wasn't four months. It was 10 days this time. And they said, yeah, we kind of like what you're doing. It, it wasn't this artist's most famous song. And uh, so, so you can have it. You can, you can use the song. But we need the same money as Bruce Springsteen is, is getting. And I said, you can have it. And it was Paul McCartney. It was a McCartney solo song. So we opened with Paul McCartney, closed with Bruce Springsteen. So um, it isn't a question of hard as much as it is um, money. Can you afford it? Or finding the right argument to give them that they will make a deal with you on, on what the song is. Now, what I have to imagine, that coal, was that cold difficult with the Coltrane documentary? No, it was actually quite easy. The, um, the film was funded by the three record labels that collectively own his catalog. Ah. So we agreed that we were going to... Uh, they never uh, Record companies never like to give away anything. So um, they wouldn't do it for free. But we, we worked out a deal where everybody got paid $100 for every song. Hundred dollars for the publishing, hundred dollars for the master recording, and so it was Plus negligible. It, it, it's a, like a commercial for his it's commercial catalog. for their artist, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the catalog. Yeah. Well, John, I would like to thank you so much and for coming here and speaking to us. It's been a pleasure. Likewise, enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, and thank you so much. And I'll let John know. Give him a little round of applause. Thank <laughs> you so much. All right, thank you. And if you want to hang around, I have some treats for some people. If okay. we'll give away. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. We'll go with a question over there. Sure. Yeah. That's an excellent question. And what it really does is define what kind of filmmaker someone is. Uh, is there an agenda? and that they are trying then to pursue that agenda. 
in, in which case they do one of the, the, the avenues that you talk about where it's they only ask questions that will support that agenda. Um, I'm the opposite. I, I, I don't have any agenda, any point of view. I know what the story is I want to tell, but I want to hear it from the people that I'm interviewing. So I try to be um, non-emotional or, or non-political um, in, in a sense of, of asking those kinds of questions. Um, and then I sort of figure out what points I'm going to use to tell that story. But it's a really great question. And what you'll see is there are some documentaries that come out today that are so either left or right, making their points politically, for example. Um, and, and to me, those documentaries aren't as interesting because it's so clear they just had a point of view and that's all they really cared about. Mm -hmm. There was a, a documentary I saw on, on HBO a few years ago. It was about Woody Allen, the filmmaker. And it was from the point of view of, of Mia Farrow and her son. And it was so clear their agenda was he's a scumbag who, who sexually assaulted my daughter. And that's the point of view that the film took. And what I felt watching it uh, was that it was an emotional agenda, but they didn't back it up with facts. Th there was nothing in that film that actually would prove what it was they were suggesting. So I just find it's really, really hard if you, if you come out uh, just with an, uh, an agenda. And in some cases, I think also, when you have a film that does take a particular point of view, you're maybe only preaching to the choir of, of who takes that point of view with you. You're not really going to persuade anybody. I mean, think about it in, in today's marketplace. If somebody did a, a pro-Trump film or an anti-Trump film, those camps are pretty polarized and, and, and pretty sure of what they think, and you're not really going to persuade either side. Mm -hmm. So I try to tell stories that you'll find intriguing and compelling uh, without having an agenda. Does that make sense? Mm. Thank you. Any other people have a question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Question was, did it did, did it affect the marketing um, of our of our film with with the approach that we took to certain things? Uh, and it didn't really, you know. Um, again, what I try to do is find a, a a largely unknown but very compelling story, and that's what we try to market. But you, ha it's an interesting question that we were uh, dealing with, which is here we have a, a story about a band. Does that then make it a music documentary? Do you market it as a music documentary? Do you mus uh, market it as something else? And I just felt so many of the music documentaries are what we would call cradle to grave. It's a, they were born here, they did this, they did this, and then they died or, or whatever. Um, and it, it's not that kind of a film. So what we decided to do, and you see it in the artwork that we did and in the trailer that we made, is that we really uh, marketed it as a political thriller. It's about a band stuck in these, this political polarized environment and what happened to them. And so I don't know that it really, it didn't have any of those same things that you find in an uh, agenda-driven doc. So really good question. Um, and, and we did struggle with it. But I think what you saw uh, was interesting, the, the Rolling Stone journalist that we interviewed, that he wrote that article and, and you saw what it was. What was kind of interesting about it is you, you talk about expectations. I came into an interview with this guy thinking he was just going to tell me he hated the band and hated what they did and then wrote this article. And what we got was a guy who admitted he was an alcoholic back then. And, and, he, and, and, and part of um, his recovery is he has to be honest about things in his past. And so we caught him on the day where he was really honest. And that, you, know, you talk about sitting there li listening to it. It's like, wow, this is in the movie. This is just great. And those are the things that, that you get very lucky. You can't necessarily plan for those. All right. Th thank you so much. Thank you for your questions, guys. So.
Um, again, thank you, John. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. And um, thank you all for coming tonight to the screening. All right. Take care.